Hi. So last week, when I was talking about machine language tools and assembly language tools on the Apple II, I said I would give an example of why people would go to the trouble of using these, um, and also try to give an, an actual example of, of them in use, doing something minimally useful. So we're going to write a toy program in both basic and in machine language, uh, rather in assembly language for the 6502 that hopefully will shed some light on this. So what you see on the screen here is a memory map of the Apple II. Um, we could spend a half hour on this. We're going to spend 30 seconds. The important things about this to realize is that we have uh, memory locations that are assigned to um, actual hardware effects. So for example, here in the 2000 to 3FFF range, we've got high res mode one. We're gonna leverage that in this video so that we can see the effects of our program of storing values in memory very directly. The other thing I wanna draw your attention to are these three registers, A, X, and Y. Um, A is the accumulator. That's the only register with which you can do actual uh, arithmetic in any meaningful sense. Um, the X and Y registers are largely used for indexing. And the important thing about these registers is that they are 8-bit. They hold values from 0 to 255. If you want to go larger than that, you have to do some work. And in this video, we will show some of that work um, in a very basic sense. Then there's this process status register, which has a bunch of flags. Those flags are conditioned after almost every 6502 assembly language instruction. So if I load the accumulator with the value 6, then the Z flag in the register will be off. If I load the accumulator with the value 0, then the Z flag will be high. Likewise, if I add with carry and overflow a register or a memory location, the C flag, the carry flag, will be high. And these flags are used by the branch instructions in the 6502 to determine what to do. So let's return and let's start with just AppleSoft Basic and see what this looks like. So I just entered high-res graphics mode and high-res incidentally in this context means like something along the lines of 192 by 188. It's really, it's not very high, it's probably the size of a postage stamp on your monitor. So we could just poke a value into memory. This starts at hex 2000, which I calculated before, is 8192. We'll poke the value 85 in there, which is the bit pattern um, 01010101. We get a purple line. So let's poke it into 8193. And now we get white and green. Um, this is another topic that could take hours to talk about, the strangeness of how graphics worked on the Apple II. I'm going to leave it with a one-sentence description. Graphics on the Apple II were really, really strange. And you'll see how strange as we write this program. So let's clear that, and let's write our three-line basic program. It's going to enter graphics mode. It's going to iterate from the beginning of high-res page one to the end of high-res page one. Um, and yes, I actually got out a calculator and figured that out. I don't know that offhand. We're going to poke our value into that memory location, um, which literally means set that memory location to the value integer decimal 85, and then continue our iteration. Hopefully this will work without any embarrassing mishaps. And we can see memory is now starting to fill with this crazy pattern that the Apple II uses. Um, while it's filling, I mean, I'll mention that whether it's green or white or purple has to do with whether the drawing, that bit pattern is starting on an odd or even numbered memory location. Um, how anyone did real art on these devices is almost beyond me. Uh, but they did. People did amazing things with it. The other thing is you'll notice it's filling in in a window shade pattern here. Uh, we are filling memory sequentially, but the memory map for high-res mode was interlaced uh, in order to save essentially chips. Uh, 
So that took about, I would say, 20 to 30 seconds. So that's basic doing literally nothing else but put a value in memory. So let's do our machine language version here. I left the sounds on in my emulator because I like them. They make me feel all nostalgic. Uh, I will also own up to the fact that I wrote this program in advance, so I don't want you to think that I'm uh, particularly full of expertise on this. Um, it's just, you do the work and it's actually very slow going if you're going to be uh, working with this stuff ahead of time. And pen, pen and paper is actually a good way to start. So we'll go ahead and enter, enter the assembler, the editor assembler. We're going to start adding code. We're going to start at my favorite memory address, hex 800. And we're going to define some variables. These are not Apple II um, opcodes. These are meta opcodes that this, this particular assembler supports. So this thing where I'm sitting graph to CO50, this is interesting. A lot of the hardware functions on the Apple II were controlled by what we call soft switches. Um, a soft switch is just a value where if you read or write to it, um, it'll have some effect. And early in the Apple II's life, most of these soft switches worked if you read from them. And if you think about that, that's, that's really unintuitive, that you're going to read a value from memory and it's going to have this potentially massive side effect. Um, my understanding is that later in the computer's life cycle with the Apple II GS, um, they kind of moved to a world where if you wanted to tweak a soft switch, you had to actually write to it, which makes a lot more sense to me. So if you'll cast your mind back to the picture of the registers, I said these were 8-bit registers. and We want to fill memory from 2,000 to 4,000, essentially. That's more than 255 values, so how are we going to do it? And the answer is you're going to use pointers um, on the zero page. And the format for this is a little bit crazy, but I'm just going to do it and hopefully my explanation will make sense. If it doesn't, please inquire in the comments and I will be happy to explain in more detail. So I um, created two memory values on the, what's called the zero page of the Apple II, which is memory from zero to FF. Um, one is going to be our least significant bit. One is going to be our most significant bit. You'll note that the least significant bit is coming first. And that is sadly a requirement here. Um, let's create a label just for a start of a program. Um, so we want to start filling memory at memory location 2000. So we're going to take 20 and we're going to store it in our most significant bit memory location FB. Um, of course, and I realize I just have a typo, so let me go fix that. We're going to store zero in our least significant bit. And the, um, as I said, I think last week, the hash tag here, the hash mark means take this value literally and load it into the accumulator rather than dereference memory to get that value. Okay, let's condition our Y register because we're going to need that as an offset. And then we're going to poke all of our soft switches. So we will just load the accumulator with the values in these soft switches and we're going to throw them away. We're not actually going to use them. Um, and now we should be in graphics mode and we have our pointer set up pointing to um, memory location 2000. So we'll start our loop. Uh, we're going to load our pattern, which is just hex 55. And now we get to the confusing bit. So one of the humps you have to get over if you want to learn any assembly language, but particularly I think the 6502, is this idea of addressing modes, which are opcodes that look the same as other opcodes, but behave kind of radically differently. So if you see on line 12, we're storing a value in LSB, 
Uh, that just means literally take the value in the accumulator and stick it into LSB. Here we want to do something more complicated. We're going to use a form of addressing called indirect indexed, not to be confused with indexed indirect, which is also at a different addressing mode with a totally different behavior. So what does this say? This says store the accumulator in the value pointed to by LSB and the byte that comes after LSB reversed plus whatever value I have in the Y register. So the y, y register is zero, we can forget that. LSB is zero, zero. MSB at this moment is two, zero. We take those, reverse them. That means two, zero, zero, zero. That means the value in the accumulator is going to be stored at memory location two, zero, zero, zero. Uh, one thing I, I was thinking about showing uh, and I didn't was that you can only do this with zero page memory addresses. If I had tried to set up this pointer somewhere above the zero page, the processor just doesn't support that addressing mode and we'd be out of luck. All right, my first cut of this program involved do, using add with carry and then showing how the carry flag worked. And I just decided it, it just takes too long. So I'm gonna take a shortcut here. We're just gonna go ahead and directly increment the value in FA. Uh, and we're gonna notice when it goes to zero because we're gonna use this branch equal instruction, which means does the process, is the processor status flag set to zero? And we're gonna call a symbol we haven't defined yet. So if we are, if, if LSB is not zero, we just wanna continue our loop. But if LSB is zero, then we want to let it stay zero but we also then want to increment our most significant bit, which we can do like this. Um, we want to keep doing this until we get up to memory location 4000, because 3FFF is the end of high res page one. So we're going to compare whatever's in the MSB with 40. Um, so this comparison operator will not change either the accumulator or what's in MSB, but it will condition the processor status flags. Um, and so if 40 is equal to whatever's in MSB, then it will be zero and we're done. If we're not done, then go back to our loop and let's throw a break there just so that, um, just so that we're done. So the program terminates. Okay, I'm sure I typed something wrong and we'll have a an error, but let's try it. Okay, good. So we seem to have a program. Let us save the source code. I'm just going to call it that. Okay, let's save the object code. Ha ha ha. Let's see. All right, let's try that again. Make sure our program is still there. Save the source code. I think I have to assemble it again because it's out of memory now. Save the object code. Is it going to work? Please work. All right. Let's load this into memory. Uh, I think I just called it that. I believe it should be at memory location 800. Let's check. There it is. Let's run it. Boom. Done. Probably less than a second. Uh, if we go into high res mode first and run it again, we should be able to get even an even better look at it. One, two, three. All right, so there you go. I'd say that's at least two orders of magnitude faster um, 
than the basic version. And that, more than anything else, is why people used assembly language on the Apple II. That said, fast is not the only value in software. Um, as you saw, it was kind of a pain in the butt to have to manipulate 16-bit values. Uh, the most famous example of someone, I think, on this platform choosing convenience over speed was Wozniak, who got so frustrated in doing the integer basic math needed to, um, um, the 16-bit math needed to write his integer basic. He wrote a virtual machine that lives inside the Apple II integer basic ROM, which is incredibly slow, but incredibly convenient. And a lot of his integer basic routines are written in that virtual machine, which is called Sweet 16. He wrote a few articles about it. Um, it's worth a Wikipedia search if you're interested in that sort of thing. But that's just an example. It's not always a cut and dry case to say, well, I'm just going to use assembly language because that's the best. Uh, because at a certain point, the precious resource is your brain. And as I hope I demonstrated today, even to do the simplest task, the equivalent of a three-line basic program, took me, and I mean, I'm not the best, but it took me 30 lines of assembly to do it. If you got rid of the symbols, maybe you could um, trim a few off. Maybe you can get it down to 15 lines or something. It's still a lot more work, and it's a lot more ponderous. So this has been Programming Like It's 1979. Thanks for watching.